Hello, I'm Bethany from Cook Fox Architects, and I'm here to speak about biophilia. There we go. Show of hands really quick. How many of you guys have heard of biophilia before? Great, good, excellent. How many of you guys feel like you could actually define biophilia? How many of you guys use biophilia in your daily work? Great, excellent. So as I said, I'm Bethany Borrell. Um, I work for Cook Fox Architects here in New York City, and I'm here to share with you how I have used biophilia in the built environment. So let's start with just some key terms, biophilia. Basically, it's the love of life, the love of life. It's not just nature, all forms of life. How does that start to integrate into the built environment? So biophilic design, strategies that start to synthesize these natural elements into the built environment so that humans, occupants, will have similar experiences and effects, the physiological, the psychological effects of being in nature while in the built environment. We have this programmed into us. A lot of our responses are evolutionarily programmed, right? Think about prospect and refuge, very basic. When you go to the restaurant, when you go to a restaurant, and you have your choice of seats, more often than not, people will pick the banquette in the corner, not the seat in the middle of the restaurant. Because of the refuge, because you know that you, your back is protected, no one will sneak up from behind you, and you're able to prospect over the restaurant. It's programmed into us. There's been such a huge body of research that has been built up over time um, from a lot of our forefathers and foremothers, um, you know, Wilson, Jane Jacobs, Rachel Carson, we all know their names. So something that we use at Cook Fox um, are the 14 patterns of biophilic design written by Terrapin Bright Green, our sister company. They very acutely synthesize a ton of this research and continue to expand upon this research in ways that we can start to develop a toolkit for biophilic design and how we can start to understand how to implement that into the built environment. So as you see, it's got three categories and 14 patterns. There are significant um, impacts on your physical um, and psychological um, responses as you can start to see on the right side from some of these patterns as you experience them in the built environment. So we live in a city though. We don't live in um, the desert. We don't live in a forest. We live in a really dense, hectic, concrete city. At least I do. Probably a bunch of people traveled here. But um, Cook Fox works mostly in New York City. And so I'm going to walk you through a couple of our projects, large scale and smaller scale, to show you how we start to implement some of these elements. But a big thing for us is what we can't unknow. This research has shown us that we're morally obligated to start to implement these elements into our design processes. Once you know some of these statistics, you can't go back to designing in a way that blocks natural daylight, in a way that pulls classrooms away from windows. Um, there are just really key elements that on an urban scale and on a micro scale, you have to keep in consideration. So we usually start with Manahata. Another show of hands, who knows Manahata? Okay, great, good, good. Sorry, if my questions are elementary, I just wanna make sure. Also get your blood moving a little bit. Um, so we start with Manahata. Start to understand our site. How can we start to learn from the indigenous landscapes that used to occupy this land before that horizontal street was housed in, before this was Soho, before it was a gas station? What can we bring back to the ecological landscape here through our design process? Well, by working with the landscape, uh, sorry, the um, LPC and the DOB, we were able to um, prove and convince that the integration of this in, um, ecological infrastructure is key, is crucial to the actual design of the building. So that now there's a bit of market transformation. 
now what tenants are looking for, what they're expecting, because of what they are able to experience is different. And another project that I'll walk you through very quickly is 150 Charles. What happens when policy and zoning dictate a contextually inappropriate um, urban condition like this one? So if we just did the tower in the park, this is what it would look like. But it's not appropriate around smaller scale, low rise brownstones, blocks light, blocks views of the river. What do you do? You work with eight community boards. You speak with neighborhood stakeholders. And you work with the city to rewrite zoning, to create a new form that allows for planted landscape working your way up the building, not just at the park level. So that you can create gracious setbacks that can be planted, so that the building starts to work as a park. And allows you to connect to that river. And it pulls the landscape, the active park along that Hudson River Parkway into the West Village instead of blocking it. And the case of historic structures, like this one, just a bit north of the one that we were just looking at. What happens when you have an older building that is, it was, thriving when the shipping industry was uh, transporting um, merchandise from the river through these uh, storage facilities and to our kitchen tables, to our living rooms? What happens when that's no longer the industry? It becomes a physical barrier between the neighborhood and that riverscape. How do you start to think about that? You start to unpave, celebrate what's, not, what's original to the building. We kept the railroad tracks. If you look very closely at this big image, we have the railroad ties there still. But you start to peel back and you create a front porch condition so that it's not a little tiny tunnel that people can kind of catch a glimpse of the river through but instead it's a gracious landscaped plaza that the neighborhood can um, walk through and see through and experience to get to that landscaped element. And pulling the landscape up through the building, so it's integrating it on all dimensions so that the full view of the river is available um, to all the occupants. It's one of the city's most valuable resources, I think. So being able to share it with a neighborhood that has been blocked from it for a long time is pretty important, even at a large scale building like this. So let's take a second and zoom in. So we also uh, work on the human scale. How do we pull this to the human scale? Um, you're taking a look at our terrace here. This is at our office. When we started the design for our new office space, which is where this terrace is, the first thing we did, we talked to humans. We talked to the people who were going to actually be using the space. We helped the entire um, group of people that will be living and breathing and, and creating in this space to define goals, sustainability goals, uh, efficiency goals, uh, to hear what people had to say, what they needed, to hear their desires and their needs so that we could reach into our kit of parts and our toolbox of biophilic design strategies and have a framework for what we're working towards so that everybody can experience an efficient um, and healthy work environment. So going back to that idea of prospect and refuge, back to the diner, <laughs> back to the caves, um, how you start to integrate that into an interior condition. I think that this image shows that pretty well where it's a really residential scale there's a comfortable moment. As soon as anybody goes into this little meeting room, they sit in that seat in the corner where you're, you're uh, protected and you can prospect out over the rest of the studio. And also visual connection with nature. It sounds really simple, but it's so effective. So we have oriented all of our desks against windows and we have a northern viewing terrace and a western and eastern um, occupiable terraces. The point not only of having everybody close to the windows for daylighting, clearly, but also so that everybody can experience that moment of um, non-rhythmic stimulation when the grasses blow in the breeze. These elements reduce your cortisol levels. They reduce your stress levels. 
and architects are stressed out, so it's really helpful to pull that back a little bit, however we can. Complexity and order is another element that we like to bring in. As humans, we want to organize things, right? We want to put things kind of in categories and for better, for worse, and, but the idea of ge uh, geometric complexity and order, it calms us, again, with those cortisol levels. If there seems to be a rationale for why things are set at different datum, responding to original architecture, uh, that is key for helping us feel safe. This is an image of our East Terrace, nestled amongst historic buildings all around us. We're on 57th Street, so that is um, originally Automobile Row, so you've got some pretty um, historic elements around here. But creating a park up on the 17th floor for our guests and our um, occupants to enjoy, to actually step outside into nature. I'll geek out for a minute. We love to make patterns, and we don't do it with Grasshopper. We do it the old school way. So we find um, something on site that is important to us, that is native to that site. And we start to break it down, abstract it, reconnect it, rebuild it to create um, forms and patterns that are similar, but not identical to, so that we can start to have that same response as you would to the natural pattern. Um, your, body, your mind reads it in the same way. And we start to pull, obviously, natural elements, including plants, throughout the interior of the space. But you can start to see the indirect lighting that's, um, that's reflecting off of our ceilings and, and uh, mounted to the sides of our beams disappears so that you just feel this overhead illumination. It's tied to a daylight dimming system, so the majority of our light is coming from the windows. On really bright, amazing um, summer days, the lights are off. Natural materials include live edge tables. Everyone who sits at this table ends up running their fingers across it throughout meetings. Um, it's calming. It's incredibly calming. <laughs> but we've made it really important, um, it's really important to us, I should say, that uh, the space is usable by all ages, by all species. We have apiaries that are thriving. Almost 200 pounds of honey last season. Uh, they're pretty happy. And we have planting days so that our occupants can actually, our employees can come and dig in the dirt and watch things grow and bring their families. And now I'm gonna shift over to a school that we're working on called Marymount School of New York. It's actually not too far from here. Ground up construction project for an all girls school and how we start to implement some of these strategies into the interior scape of that building. The sense of community through an uh, inter internal stair that pulls up through um, a curtain wall atrium. So maximum daylight, full exposure to the um, natural systems of um, planting out on terraces and the effects of the weather. But again, we started with a charrette. So meeting with our sustainability strategists, meeting with the client, meeting with teachers, meeting with students. It was a really long charrette, and we were able to pin down some goals and figure out what were some really key elements for us. So you can start to see that they wanted the building to be safe and resilient. Resilient was a huge thing for them, but also safety and security and the feeling of home within the school system. So, as I had mentioned before, um, the access to daylight was incredibly important to us in, this, in a school setting like this. So we pulled all of the classrooms to the primary north and south facades where they will get the most daylight. And we saved other program for the interior portion. Those accesses to daylight, also, the access to daylight is also on terraced conditions um, that are occupiable. So the girls can go out, plant, see what they're planting, see it grow, the evolution of life within this small format is crucial for girls at this age so that they can actually understand where their food is coming from, to dig in the dirt. It sounds so simple, um, yet in New York City, it's fairly rare to be able to dig your hands in dirt unless you have an amazing community garden nearby. And natural analogs, of course. Like I said, we geek out about these sorts of screens and systems. Um, but taking that to a different level with this, with this project. So we had a day with the girls where we taught them about tessellations and about biomimetic um, patterning. And they're developing a pattern that is going to be imprinted onto the facade of the building. 
so that there can be a long-term connection and sense of community and ownership for this building. So I'm gonna end with a couple big picture things. If we zoom, okay, it's big picture, but we're zooming in even farther. What happens when you realize that the most toxic things in your home are things you can't see? Material transparency is a huge key item right now in the building industry, especially in interiors. How do you start to make sure that what your children are breathing and what you are breathing isn't going to um, contain elements that are hormone disruptors? But if you think about it upstream, you gotta make sure that these manufacturing facilities are not um, jeopardizing their employees. Who's making this stuff? How is it affecting them? So holding those manufacturers responsible to make sure that they're creating healthy living environment or working environments for their employees. So that then once that material has lived its life and is um, out living its second life, it's not polluting our planet. How can we start to make sure that pre-life and post-life for all of these materials, they're able to live again. They're able to um, not end up in an ocean. So I'm gonna end with this image of um, a planted terrace here in New York City and start to understand how this greenscape can start to become Manhattan once again. It won't officially ever be that, but how can we start to make a huge impact um, step by step, little bit by little bit? If we all gather together and take one small step, we will get there much faster. So with that, thank you.